Good evening, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, together with the Presidential Communications Office. We bring you the latest, widest, and most comprehensive news coverage from the People's Television, IBC, Philippine News Agency, Philippine Information Agency, and Presidential Broadcast Service. I'm Princess Habiba Saripoda. And I'm Joe Fernandez from Radio Pilipinas. Welcome to Balitang Pambansa. Tonight's headlines. President Marcos Jr. signs into law the Enterprise-Based Education and Training or EBET Framework Act. Typhoon Marse unleashed its fury on Cagayan, damaging anything that stood in its path as authorities conduct rescue operations to bring people to safety. A survey conducted by the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative shows that the Philippines has improved significantly in preparing for disasters under the Marcos administration. The Department of Justice, or DOJ, forms a task force to help in the investigation of extrajudicial killings that allegedly happened during the conduct of the drug war by the previous administration. At long last, a much-awaited piece of legislation institutionalizing the linkage of education and training to industrial requirements. Hence, it was an auspicious moment in the People's Palace as the President, led by key members of the legislature and its men and women in the cabinet, in inking Republic Act 1203 or the Enterprise-Based Education Training Framework Act earlier today, as Bien Manalo lays out in this report. Manolito Rojas was a factory worker for more than two years in Nabotas. But due to lung disease and wanting a better take-home pay, he quit his job. Then Manolito enrolled in TESDA for skills training on refrigeration and air conditioning servicing or DOMRACA. Malaking tulong po kasi sa katulad ko po na hindi po talaga ako nakatapos sa school grad lang. Pagka natapos ko po ito, pwede pong mag-increase yung Trabaho ko, gagaan, tapos lalaki pa po yung sweldo ko. Nagpapasalamat po ako sa government na tinatag nilang batas na to dahil malaking tulong po to sa mga katulad ko na karamihan na hindi po nakatapos pero may pagkakataon na maging isa silang skilled worker. Good news for people like Manolito because President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr. signed the Enterprise-Based Education and Training or EBIT Framework Act today. Proof of government's dedication and contribution together with the private sectors in strengthening technical vocational education and enterprise-based training programs. The newly minted loss aims to address the perennial job skills mismatch, dilemma in the country's workforce, reduce unemployment and underemployment, and ensure all Filipino workers are globally competitive and ready for any changes in the labor market. This law directly addresses the issues of the lack of formal training and skill mismatches, ensuring that every Filipino can contribute and benefit from our nation's growth. This legislative milestone is anchored in the government's aim to consolidate, regulate, and unify enterprise-based training under a single framework. Through this act, we will harness private sector partnerships to align our training programs with real-world industry needs. According to Senate President Francis Escudero, the country's labor market or workforce pool cannot remain stagnant in any time because of rapid changes in the labor market. The principal author and sponsor of the law, Senator Joel Villanueva, insists We wanted to uh, uh, create jobs that are sustainable and uh, that gives uh, decency and integrity to our uh, would-be workers. Through EBED Framework ACA, the relationship between the private sectors and the government will be stronger in providing trainings to workers who have the ability to adapt to global needs and build a brighter future for all Filipinos. From PTV4 Manila, BN Manalo, Balitang Pambansa. President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr. will not attend the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC Economic Leaders Week in Lima, Peru, according to Malacanang. Presidential Communications Office or PCO Secretary Cesar Chavez stated that the chief executive will not participate because he will prioritize some domestic concerns, including responding to the impact of the recent calamity. 
Instead, Department of Trade and Industry, or DTI Acting Secretary Maria Cristina Roque, who was recently appointed a special envoy to the APEC Economic Leaders Week, will represent the Philippines. The meeting will be attended by leaders, ministers, and senior officials from the 21 APEC who will work to shape trade and globalization policies. APEC aims to provide a strategic vision and directives for regional cooperation in the coming years. President Ferdinand R. Marcus Jr. expressed gratitude to Singapore for its assistance during severe tropical storm Christine. In a phone call with Singaporean Prime Minister Lawrence Wong, Marcus praised Singapore's timely support, which supported significantly held Filipinos in the hardest hit areas. The two leaders discussed strengthening their partnership in areas like humanitarian and climate challenges within the framework of ASEAN cooperation. Singapore, along with Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei, Brunei sent military aircraft to deliver relief supplies to affected regions. This follows the 2023 Memorandum of Understanding between the Philippines and Singapore on humanitarian aid and disaster relief. Land Transportation Office or LTO will open offices on Saturdays to assist those affected by Typhoons Christine and Leon who miss vehicle registrations and driver license renewals. LTO Chief Assistant Secretary Attorney Vigor Mendoza, the second directed regional offices to assess which locations need Saturday service, especially in areas heavily flooded. In Calabarzon, 14 district offices and all driver's license renewal offices or DLROs will operate on Saturdays while Cagayan's regional offices will remain open through December 21. This move is in response to work suspensions caused by the storms and President Marcus Jr.'s directive to support citizens. Late penalties for registrations are waived for affected individuals. Today, the Department of Trade and Industry, or DTI, launched its Enterprise Rehabilitation Financing Program to support recovery of MSMEs affected by recent typhoons. The program aims to serve as a lifeline and provide assistance to small business owners, particularly those who suffer damage and hit hard by Typhoon Christine, as well as those in areas in declared under a slate, uh, state of calamity by the NDRRMC. According to the DTI, MSMEs may apply for loans of up to 300,000 pesos with zero interest and no principal payment required for the first year. The loan will have an interest rate of 1% for the second year and third years. Applicants need only submit a government-issued DID, mayor's permit, proof of, bank account, proof of bank account, and other documents which can be found on the agency's website. In the meantime, the eye of the storm or typhoon is eerily still at around with the skies above half bright and dark and no clouds filled with rain and can range a few to a hundred kilometers wide in diameter. But its outer bands or walls are where the strongest and most powerful winds blow and move. And the PNP Santa Ana station in Cagayan province lay in the path of the typhoon Mars's eye and sustained her full breath earlier today as our Floyd Brands narrates this report. The door of PNP station in Santa Ana, Cagayan was blown away by the strong winds of typhoon Marse. <laughs> the ceiling of their office also collapsed. The police immediately took action to repair the damaged door. Signal number 4 is now up for the entire Cagayan province. Around 4 p.m. today, Typhoon Mars slammed into Santa Ana. In this photo taken by Aweng Alitnak, the sky lit up as the eye of the typhoon passed, but the harsh weather returned shortly after. But it was already noon when the typhoon swat was felt here because of the strong winds. This burger stand was blown all the way to the street. Street signs were blown away. The roofs of houses were damaged. This grocery store was not spared from the strong winds. Goods fell and scattered all over the floor with shelves knocked out by the strong winds. 
Police immediately evacuated residents from coastal areas to avoid the high waves caused by the storm surge. The wind shattered the door of the municipal building in Gonzaga, Cagayan. Meanwhile, in the town of Gataran, strong rains and winds were also felt. Several overflow bridges and roads are now impassable due to floods and fallen trees. Pagasa said that the northern portion of Cagayan, Apayao, and Ilocos Norte will be critically affected from today until tomorrow. This is where the strongest winds of Marse will hit. Inaasa na posibleng ang lakas ng hangin dyan ay mula 88 kilometers per hour hanggang 185 or kilometers per hour. Signal na, or 184 kilometers per hour, no? Due to the threats of strong winds, floods, and storm surge, nearly 5,000 families or about 18,000 people were evacuated. They came from 21 towns in which preemptive evacuation was conducted to ensure the safety of their residents. This is the third consecutive time that many towns in Cagayan evacuated since Typhoons Christine and Leon. With the full fur of Typhoon Marse hitting the province, the PDRRN Council remains on red alert and is ready to assist, especially in areas where the typhoon is forecast to hit hard or forcefully slump. From PTV, Floyd Brenz, Balitang Pambansa. Under President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr., the Philippines has made significant progress in disaster preparedness. A 2024 survey by the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative shows a 42% increase in disaster readiness among Filipinos over the past seven years. The survey covered 4,608 people and measured preparedness in areas like planning, training, materials, and community support. Despite this progress, the Philippines remains vulnerable to natural disasters. HHI calls for continued improvements, especially in local leadership, early warning systems, and resilient infrastructure. Meanwhile, the center of the Eye of Typhoon Marse was located over the coastal waters of Santa Ana, Cagayan. With maximum sustained winds of 175 kilometers per hour, gusting is up to 245 kilometers per hour and is moving westward at 10 kilometers per hour. Stormy weather will be felt in Cagayan Valley, Cordillera Administrative Region and Ilocos Region. Rains with gusty winds will fall in Zambales and Aurora. The rest of central Luzon will have cloudy skies with scattered rains and thunderstorms brought by the trap of Marse. Meanwhile, Metro Manila and the rest of the country will experience partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers or thunderstorms due to localized thunderstorms. Up next, the Department of Justice and the DOJ forms a task force to ensure justice is attained for supposed EJK victims. In Locos Norte's preparations for the onslaught of Typhoon Marse is in full swing. The details and more when Balitang Pambansa returns. Alam naman natin lahat na tubig is life. Kapag walang tubig, paano tayo magsasurvive? Ganito ang problema ng ilan nating kababayan, lalo na tuwing may matitinding kalamidad sa bansa. Pero, isang Pilipinong inventor ang nakaisip ng isang makabagong teknolohiya na kayang tugunan ang mga suliraning ito. Abangan yan sa Siyensikat, Season 5. The Department of Trade and Industry or DTI Secretary Christina Roque as she officially launches the DTI SB Corporation Enterprise Rehabilitation Financing Program which provides financial support to businesses affected by Typhoon Christine. This program under the President Marcus Jr. Administration aims to help businesses recover and rebuild. The DTI is with all the Filipinos in this journey of recovery. The Department of Transportation or DOTR Secretary Jaime Bautista highlighted major infrastructure projects at the 8th ASEAN Italy Economic Dialogue, including the Subic Clark Manila Batangas Railway and the South Long Haul Project. 
Bautista emphasized the Philippine government's commitment to modernizing transportation under President Marcos with a focus on improving accessibility, safety and sustainability. He also noted that opportunities for bilateral cooperation with Italy on these initiatives. The task force formed by the Department of Justice or DOJ has begun investigating alleged extrajudicial killings during the Duterte administration's war on drugs. Pursuant to Department Order No. 778, signed by Justice Secretary Jesus Crispin Rimulia, the task force is directed to probe, conduct, case buildups, file necessary charges, and hold accountable those persons potentially involved in the extrajudicial killings. The task force will also assist in the ongoing investigation being conducted by Congress. Meanwhile, the newly appointed Deputy Prosecutor General of the National Prosecution Office, Richard Fadulion, stated that the investigation will not focus on any specific case. They may look into all extrajudicial, uh, extrajudicial killings cases from the past 20 years. Prescriptive period is 20 years. So there's nothing which will prevent us from looking into cold cases, cases which were probably filed as complaints before law enforcement but never reached the prosecution office. So these are cases that we can possibly look into together with the uh, current leadership of the uh, DILG. Ilocos Norte farmers have received a heads up from their provincial LGU to find protective cover for their crops and relocate their livestock and or pets to safer or higher grounds in preparation for Typhoon Mars's impending passage through and across the province. A preemptive evacuation of 49 families or 143 people has been completed in the coastal communities and flood-prone areas of Bagudpod while close Close to two and a half thousand family food packs have been distributed in Lawag City as we hear Pia Ilocos Norte's Emma Guillermo's report. The Locos Norte Provincial Government advised farmers to prepare and protect their crops and livestock from the expected strong winds and rain brought by Typhoon Marse. Farmers are urged to transfer their livestock to higher and safer grounds away from rivers and mountains to avoid casualties in case of heavy rain and flooding. Meanwhile, local government units are already taking steps to ensure the safety of their residents. In Pagudpud Town, a preemptive evacuation for 49 families or 143 individuals in coastal and flood-prone barangays was conducted this morning. In Lawag City, around 2,300 relief packs are ready to be distributed to affected residents. Their Barangay Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Councils are also activated to monitor and respond in their respective barangays. So the disaster risk uh, management staff will be already staying at the City Hall and already monitoring barangays, especially those barangays most prone to flooding such as Gabu and La Paz, okay? And, and, other, and there are other barangays as well. So please understand that we're very much on alert now. Governor Matthew Marcus Manotok also suspended classes in public and private schools as well as government offices today. Philippine Airlines Tropical Cyclone Bulletin of Pagasa, the northern part of the province, including the towns of Pagudpud, Bangui, Vintar, Dumalneg, Adams, Bakara, Pasukin, and Burgos are under Tropical Cyclone Wind Signal Number 4. The rest of the province is under Signal Number 3. From the Philippine Information Agency, Ilocos Norte, Emma Guillermo, Balitang Pambansa. The Barangay Information Officers Network in Western Visayas, led by the Philippine Information Agency, strengthens grassroots communication by organizing and training the officers to effectively deliver government messages to local communities. Philippine Information Agency Negros Occidental's Bernard Susbilia has more. 
For widest possible grassroots reach, this is the core of strengthening the Barangay Information Officers Network in Western Visayas. Barangay Information Officers Network, or BION, an initiative of the Philippine Information Agency seen to expand the reach of government communication efforts to the barangays, has progressed from organizing the Barangay Information Officers to capacitating them with relevant trainings. The Philippine Information Agency 6 is simultaneously conducting the second phase of the program which is capacitating these community information officers like the 25 Barangay Information Officers or BIOS in Victoria City, Negros Occidental who were trained in digital literacy and journalism principles. I am very thankful for them uh, because they are also the ones who are going to uh, give factual information and be our good governance ambassadors for uh, the city of Victoria through the barangays. <laughs> Not be a go. Some postings, teaching very responsible postings, sad or nothing. Matuto, matuto, what is a book at page? Not in the book, the Canada, the Recently, PIA6 organized other bio networks of La Castellana in Negros Occidental, Pasi City in Iloilo Province, and the municipalities of Ivesan, Mambusao, Pilar, and Hamindan in Capiz. Barangay Information Officer Anne Christine B. Nicolas of Barangay Haina Sur in Hamindan Town said the bio orientation gave meaningful insights about their new function, noting information given to people must always be truthful. Thank you sa seminar. Mas ang aton nga knowledge at aton nga nasairan kung paano yung pag mga effective nga information officer para sa aton nga mga tao sa aton nga in Hamtik Town and Tike Province, at least 40 Barangay Information Officers were also organized and capacitated on Disaster Risk Reduction and Management or DRRM reporting, social media management, and media relations. As per the latest data, the Region 6 now has more than 500 organized Barangay Information Officers. This number is expected to grow larger with the PIA6's continuing efforts to establish the BIOS, who are instrumental in amplifying government communications to the barangays. From the Philippine Information Agency, Negros Occidental, Bernard Cisnilia for Balitang Pambansa. Department of Bad Budget and Management Secretary Amena Pangandaman says that government is ready to provide support to disaster-stricken areas. Under the marching orders of President Ferdinand R. Marx Jr., funds have been allotted and that there will be a backup funding source in case it is needed by, by those affected by calamities. A DBM chief issued this statement amid concerns of some agencies depleted quick response funds due to several weather disturbances. The National Para Games will make a long-awaited return after a five-year hiatus. Arian Maliari of Radio Pilipina Sports has this report. A bigger field of para-athletes, numbering to 900 called out from 72 cities and provinces, are set to display their skills in the 8th edition of the Philippine National Para Games. Nine para sports including archery, athletics, badminton, bosha, chess, powerlifting, swimming, table tennis, and wheelchair basketball will be played simultaneously at the Rizal Memorial Sports Complex in Manila and Phil Sports Complex in Pasig City from November 11 to 14. With the full backing of the Philippine Sports Commission and funding support from Senator Pia Cayetano and Senator Bongo, the PNPG 2024 is highly anticipated by the para sports community since the biennial games were shelved for over five years due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Philippine Paralympic Committee Secretary General Goody Custodio expressed optimism that this year's PNPG will boost their grassroots and elite level programs with the competitions serving as basis for selection of national pool and team for the 2025 para sports calendar. The PPC is very excited for the comeback of the uh, Philippine National Para Games because the last time we we had the PNPG is no 2019. So, ngayon, ito na naman tayo. We're looking for new talents and uh, ano, we need ano, new talents for the upcoming international events. So, talagang pinopursue natin ito. PNPG is the cradle of the country's finest para-athletes who made it to the Paralympic Games, such as swimmers Angel Autumn and Ernie Gawilan, and bronze medalist powerlifter Adeline Dumapong and table tennis player Josephine Medina.
For Radio Pilipinas Do Sports, Arjen Maliare, Balitang Pambansa. And that concludes our rundown of the latest, widest, and most comprehensive news and information from all across the nation. From Radio Pilipinas, I'm Joe Fernandez. This is your trusted news source, always ready to inform and serve the Filipino people. Catch Balitang Pambansa again tomorrow at 7 a.m., 12 noon, 6 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. for more updates and developments. From Radio Pilipinas, I'm Princess Habiba Saripaudak, and this is Balitang Pambansa. Balitang Pambansa.